the stone was rolled away. You know, the women showed up at the tomb at, 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 to go see Jesus' tomb, and they asked the question, who will roll the stone away? Right? Now, some of you tonight have come, and you have a stone in your life, and it's too big for you, and uh, you're wondering what God can do with your stone. And some of you online, you're asking yourself the same question. So we're going to just take a few minutes tonight and answer the question. Um, we're going to look at two or three pretty obscure people from the book of Exodus that you probably have never heard of, and if you have, you're, you're a pretty good Bible reader. So if you open up to the book of Exodus uh, and follow along, uh, there's some real heroic people out there, you know, that are, we just don't know about. They make decisions that nobody sees in places that they don't know, and God does great things with that. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to talk about a mother, a daughter, an absentee father, and a rebellious son. We just about covered all the bases, didn't we? Sounds like some of us, or what we used to be, right? So let's just pray for a minute. Father, we, uh, we come into your presence just as Serge says. There's really nothing else but to be in your presence, Father. And so we're here now. We ask that you would open our minds, open our hearts, help us to understand the word of God and the authority in it, that it would pierce us as a, a, like a, a two-edged sword, um, dividing a, asunder soul and spirit and giving us answers to our very practical problems. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Exodus chapter 6, this is what we read. In Exodus 6, verse 20, Amram took his wife, Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, the years of the life of Amram being 137 years. This little verse is tucked in the Bible. It's Moses' parents listed 12 times in the Bible, and we know absolutely nothing about Amram. Amram married his aunt. Is that weird or what? Now, some of you have some strange marriages. You, you woke up and you said, why, why did I marry this person? Or why did they marry me? Right? Right? Uh, or, or some of you say, we're just not very compatible. Well, imagine poor Jacobet in a day of maybe arranged marriages that um, somebody arranged that she would marry her nephew. Now, that was a day and age when, when there was no contraception, and so there was women might bear children for 25 years, and so you might be the same age as your aunt. So here we have the foundation of Moses' family. Can God do something with a strange marriage? So now we come to Exodus 2. We have to go back because the parents of Moses are not named in Exodus 2. They're not named until chapter 6. And so this is what we read in the book of Exodus <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi... So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, <clears throat> she hid him three months. <clears throat> but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes, that's reeds, for him, dabbed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. Why, when the baby starts crying at three months, does she have to do something like this? Well, the last verse of the previous chapter says that the people of Israel were getting so um, numerous and they wanted to control the population, so the Egyptians commanded that the midwives um, um, kill the children and then they forced the mothers to kill the children and throw them into the river. That's what they were told to do, throw them into the river. So this woman, <clears throat> uh, the, <clears throat> the aunt of her husband Amram, it says, um, thought about this. And look what she does. 
the Spirit of God seems to be at work in this little child. And she knew that. She knew that the Spirit of God was active in the child. She says, it's a beautiful child. Now, I know some of you women, you'll say, I've never seen an ugly baby. Well, <clears throat> maybe that's true, but this baby was really beautiful. Somehow, the Spirit of God was on the child. Does, it, does God teach parents about their children when they're babies? Let me tell you a story about my wife's grandmother, my father-in-law's mother. She had five children. She prayed for, if I get this right, um, a pastor, a missionary, a teacher, a nurse, um, and a farmer. Do you know what God gave her? A pastor, a missionary, a teacher, a nurse, and a farmer. Let me tell you something. God can teach parents what the destiny of their children is even before the womb. John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit from the mother's womb. Parents know. <clears throat> Jacobed knew. Even though she was from a kind of a strange um, marriage. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm reading into the text a little bit, but how come everybody else we know about Abraham, Isaac, Jake, we know about their dads, but Moses, we don't know anything about him. But he lived for 137 years, so he was still alive when Moses spent 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, and came back, Amram was probably still alive, but we don't hear anything about him. So it only takes one act of a godly mother or even a godly father to, have, to make a world-changing decision. Just one. It just takes one. You might be in an apartment crying in New York City. Maybe you're in Finland. Maybe you're in Philippines or Brazil or France or Israel or somewhere saying, God, I don't, nobody knows who I am. Nobody knew who Moses or Amram and Jacobed were. They were two slaves in a foreign country that nobody had ever heard of before. So <clears throat> you can only hide what God is doing so long. Some of you don't want to bring God, God's work in your life and in your family out in the open, but some, you can't. Uh, the baby's crying, and you're going to have to do something. So this baby is kind of like an inconvenience. Uh, it cre uh, Moses, well, we don't know his name yet. He's, this baby creates instability. <clears throat> He's human inconvenience, but not with God. Sometimes we think our children are inconvenience inconveniences, uh, but God has a plan for them. And the, and the baby's crying, but that crying baby is what touches the heart of the lost woman who eventually gets her. So we have this absentee father. If you notice in the text, if you look carefully, the text says nothing about Amram. Verse 2. So when the woman conceived and bore a son, when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months, and when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, dabbed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the riverbank. She was obedient to the law. She threw the child into the river, except she put it in a little basket that was boat-like. It's actually the same word that's used for an ark in Noah. Noah's ark, Jacobed's ark. So where's Amram, the absentee father? Now maybe Amram, we got to give Amram some credit. Maybe he was away cutting stones for an Egyptian government building. Maybe he had Aaron with him and all there was was a single mother that was actually married but had to act as a single mom. Now, sometimes in our culture today, we have marriages where the spiritual person in the home is acting like a single mom or a single dad because the other spouse really isn't making spiritual decisions. So this is the case with Jacobet. It's very clear. She is the hero, at least one of them. 
So what do you do when your spouse is absent from spiritual things? What do you do? You act in faith. You act in faith. You find God's way. And she makes a bold kitchen decision. Now, I don't know if she was in the kitchen, but that's what we're going to say tonight. She had to make the decision somewhere. Was she cooking for her, uh, uh, um, uh, Aaron and Miriam and whatever other children she might have had? <sighs> she makes a mama-made mustard seed decision of faith. That's what she does. <clears throat> she makes the little ark. She puts her child in it. And lo and behold, uh, she sets it afloat. Now, sometimes we have these decisions that we make as parents. We don't know whether we should put our kids in public school because who's going to educate my child? I don't know whether I should put my, my child in Christian school because, after all, they teach a different theology. I don't know whether I should be homeschooling, but I can't homeschool because I work every day. I don't know whether I should put my child in daycare. I don't know whether my child should have an operation right now. I don't know if I trust the doctor. I don't know if I trust those people. I have a, I have a, a, a college student. I don't want my child to go to the um, Pennsylvania University Institute of Egyptian Learning and pay $45,000 to have them dismantle my child. And the worst is a custody battle. When you have children that are involved and you end up in before some court, and who's going to get the child? Will mom get the child or dad get it? Will I get the child or will they get the child? And then you lose the child to some, to stepmom. You lose the child to stepmom. And not only that, in Moses' case, stepmom gets to name the child. Imagine if you had a child and your spouse went through, you went through a divorce and your spouse got the child and then your step, the child's stepmother gives your child a different name than what you gave them. How would you feel about that? Because look at what it says in verse uh, uh, 9 and 10. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him. So they put, well, let, let's, let me give you a little background here. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, well, let's just, we'll roll back the clock. So the baby's floating on top of the water. It's very important. The baby's floating. We'll come back to that in a minute. The baby's floating. And look what it says. Miriam, or we don't know if it's Miriam. We assume that it's Miriam, but Mo Moses' sister um, start, the mom can't even look at what happens to the child. So Miriam, it says, the sister in verse 4 stood afar off to know what would, what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. Her maidens walked along the riverside, and when she saw the ark among the reeds, she said to her maid, go get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said, that is, uh, the baby's sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. So here's Miriam. She's following along the riverbank, waiting to see what's happened. And Pharaoh's daughter comes along. What would you think? Um, how many teenagers maybe online or in the sanctuary here would have the boldness to go up to Ashley Biden or Ivanka Trump or Malia or Sasha Obama and say, hey, you want this baby? I can find somebody that will nurse it for you and you can adopt it because that's what happens. The boldness of Miriam is amazing. When mom is bold, daughter is bold. When dad is bold, Son is bold. In this case, dad's not around. Moses doesn't get it right for 80 years. When 
When Jochebed couldn't stay and watch, Miriam followed along. Now, imagine Miriam 80 years later when the exodus happens and they crossed the Red Sea on dry land and they get to the other side. What does Miriam do? At 90, usually when you read the children's book, she looks like she's about 16, right? Miriam, I've got Moses, he's a baby, right? 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, goes back. Miriam's got to be at least about 90. She grabs that tambourine. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. You know that song, right? That's not the way we picture it. That's not the way you see it in the movies. Listen, Miriam is 90 years old, but she's the one who could see Moses was on top of the water and you wanted him under the water. You wanted mom to throw him into the river so he would drown. And now the Egyptians are in the sea under the water where you wanted to kill God's man. One of the strange heroes about this is this teenage girl who appears, we don't really know much about her until later on. She's praising God because of water, because they walk through on dry land. And the drowning was the one who intended to kill God's man. Now, Moses is a social assistance baby. It's probably a little controversial if I said he was a welfare baby. Social assistance. She got to get paid. Jacob had got paid to raise her child. Now, people get, people get criticized for um, collecting governmental checks. But you know, in the Bible, one of the most important people in the scripture, his mom got a government check. God can use public assistance to raise deliver. In verse 9, she says, I'll give you your wages. She got paid to do God's business. It's like Je- uh, Jonah. Do you know the story of Jonah? He went down, he went down to uh, Joppa and bought a ticket to go the other direction, to the Spanish Riviera, when God called him to go to Nineveh. I would much rather go to the Spanish Riviera, but he got swallowed by a whale. When you do it your way, you have to pay your own ticket. God, God pays a ticket. God pays a ticket when you do it his way. <clears throat> now, of course, people are talking. People are talking about, hey, look at Jacobet. She's in with the princess. All right? She gets the public protection. She gets a government check, and we get our children killed. It's not really fair. Um, but you know what? It's God who has his hand on the child. It's not about what people are saying. It's not about... Uh, all the rules, God had a plan. And he even let the foreign woman name the deliverer. So if you look in verse 10, <clears throat> and, and the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she called his name Moses saying, because I drew him out of the water. <clears throat> I don't want other people naming my children. And I don't like it when I hear other people giving other people nicknames. I've had some bad nicknames in my life. I didn't like them, right? But you know something? God let her name this child. You want to name him, draw him out? That's fine. Because I'm drawing out my people. He is going to be a living metaphor, and he is going to picture what I'm about to do. And if you want to name him that, that's a good name. I like that name, God says, because that's my plan. So God has his destiny even when um, man does not want to conform to it. Now, um, imagine, do you really think that Jochebed was, realized that when she had this child and placed him in the river, that she was about to have a power encounter with the Almighty and see how his circumstantial providence works and sovereignty comes in, in real life circumstances, she had no idea. But she knew that was a beautiful child and that God's hand was on that child. When God's hand is on 
you or on one of your children and you walk in that conviction, you are ushered into the experiential power of God. You know, we want to do things together as parents and we want to agree, and, but one person has to have a vision. And one ha parent has to see God at work. And one parent has to make a kitchen decision it, it, because there may not be any other way than that one person. <clears throat> Jacobet, are you listening? Are you listening online? Miriam, you 10, 12, 14-year-old girl? Listen, when mom stays home because the baby's floating and she can't see what's going to happen, you follow that baby because God has a plan for you. He wants you to be ushered into greatness. There's a silent world changer. These two women, and who do they protect? A guy named Moses who ends up in a, a Christian runaway. Now, some of you know Christian runaways, right? They're the people that God has great plans for. You think, oh, the anointing is on them. Boy, that guy can really preach. And then all of a sudden, where'd he go? Is he hiding under the pews? No, no, he like moved, he crashed and burned. In Moses' case, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his Hebrew brethren and he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand, looked left, looked right, and got caught. Went into the wilderness for 40 years. He's 80 years old. <clears throat> and God, uh, he did what it says in Galatians 4, 9, says that we should not do. We should not turn back again to the weak and beggarly elements, the elemental forces of this world. We cannot turn back. But he did. And God waited for him to get really weak, really weak. And that's when God works. Because, you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, um, God, uh, the, the, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Look, there's not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to confound the mighty and the base things and the things that are, are, are not to bring to naught the things that are so that no flesh will glory in his presence. So God waits until Moses is broken down. And then he has the flame. And when Moses reaches rock bottom and 80 years old, uh, you know, God pulls him out of retirement. Kind of like, you know, maybe a spiritual Michael Jordan. I probably shouldn't even say that. So what happens? A marriage that began in weirdness ends in greatness. And Amram married his aunt and had Moses saw God work, but had to wait another 80 years to see the fulfillment of the drawing out that Moses does to the people. Sometimes we have to wait the Christian runaways. Some of your children have run away, and they're gone. And you know that God's hand is on them. You, got, you prophesied over that child. You prayed over that child. Um, maybe it won't be until you're dead. Maybe it'll be at your funeral, hopefully you'll be able to see it like Amram did and pray that God would show it to you, that your Moses would come back to Egypt to deliver the people and live his destiny. I want to conclude with a verse from the book of Isaiah. It's a strange place to go, but it's a great chapter, and I wish you would read it, but I'm going to just read one verse, Isaiah 61, 7. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Oh, that God would take away our shame and our mistakes and our, uh, the, the ways we have hurt the family, abandoned the family, gone to Midian. And some of you online, maybe you're Moses online, you're listening and you're living in Midian and you've got a nice life for yourself there. And you know that God is calling you back to your people. <clears throat> Does God call you to something that you can't do? Yes, he always calls you to do something you can't do because if you could do it, you would get the glory. If he, if he can't do it, then God gets the glory. So don't look at the size of the obstacle in front of you and give excuses that that can't ever happen because of this or that reason. Because God is at work 
and he may be calling you to that. What can you do? You drop to your knees in your kitchen and you make a decision. You know, I was 14 years old uh, and I made a decision in a sound booth at my home church. It was about six feet wide by four feet and I was doing little sliders for the, for the audio. <clears throat> at the age of, of uh, 30, I made, um, at 24, I made an airplane decision looking out at, the, at, at Ireland, at the hills of Ireland, and made a missions decision on an airplane by myself. At the age of 30, I made the bedside decision to get married on my knees. Listen, there's the kitchen is as good a place as any to make the, the decision that God wants you to make. And wherever you are online, if you're on, a, on the highway, you pull off and look at the exit number. And remember, this is my exit 34 decision. And you make that decision. Let's pray. And if you don't, have never accepted Christ as your Savior, you do that today. Say, Jesus, I, I commit my life to you. I, I, you died for me. I, I ask that you would come in and fill me with your life and roll away the stone that's uh, just so big right in front of me that you would roll away the stone. Father, help me to make the decision to live in the destiny that you called me to be in uh, and that I, that I would go back and I, the, the people that I had hurt, I would deliver them and I would support my wife in her tough decisions and my husband in their tough decisions and my little Miriam in my house, that she would do great things. Father, we pray that you would do things above and beyond all that we could ever ask or think according to the riches of, in Christ Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.